All right. Hey, everybody. I am Jason Truding, and I am psyched to welcome you all to the uh, the Brooklyn Bound podcast, as you may know. Uh, we got a show coming up December 13th, um, and I am excited to be here with my friend, and I like Kendall that it says Professor Prof. Kendall K. Williams. Welcome, <laughs> friend. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Man, I'm going to use this chance to be a dork and say good evening. Good evening. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. I, I know. I know. I've learned so much from you. In in addition to whenever I talk to someone from Trinidad, I need to state the time of day. Yes. My, hello. And I love it. There's the good morning. There's the good night. Right. I should have said good night. That would have been even better. Right. Yeah. All good. Either way. Either way anyway, it works. <laughs> all right, man. Well, what, as you know, we were just talking before we press record. Anybody who wants to know the full background or a full background of, of Kendall, we've, we've talked together on a podcast before, um, and you can hear uh, his story about, you know, um, starting to play the pans back when he was, when he was small. I, I think I remember, Kendall, you were to go through it. Tell me, tell me how much I remember. We're in Florida. There are pans everywhere. There are uh, drums and irons and uh, engine room things around. I know you're um, close with your cousin Jerry on, and I think you explained that maybe both of you would just be playing stuff from from noon to night all day all day long, playing 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 pants, playing making drum sets out of cool objects. I think. Yeah, we were making we were literally making drum sets out of like found objects, just what whatever was in our 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 yard at the time. Yeah, or at least when I visited Trinidad. Yeah, and, I love. It. Okay, cool. So that wasn't a Florida. That was more Trinidad vibe. Yeah, um, yeah. I grew up in Miami, Florida. Yeah, Miami, Florida. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So you get we you know we talked from that moment. We got through. Uh, you know, I met Kendall um, on the East Coast. I, Kendall, I don't know if we actually met in New York or if we met at, at Princeton. Would yeah, you? not sure either. Maybe. Yeah, maybe it's it mostly Princeton. Princeton. I feel like our our um our friendship and our collaboration and all that kind of stuff really started, I think, in Princeton. But I I knew, I think maybe many of you, if you're watching this podcast, you know anything about our group or Kindle, you know Josh maybe is um Titus with you, Kindle, mm -hmm. in, in work areas. You guys have worked together for a long time. Yeah. Um, in different ways at NYU, down in Trinidad, in the Brooklyn scene. Um yeah. but I my my friendship with you is younger. Mm -hmm. um, but so what we want to talk today about is mostly what's about to go down next Tuesday when we yes. um, play the first snippets of a new piece you're writing for us. Yes. Um, so let me set this up and then I promise I'm not going to talk this whole thing, but tell me if this is how you remember this going down. Kendall yes. has written multiple pieces for So Percussion. Um, there were pieces when you were a student. Um, there were pieces you wrote for Soci, uh, for the students at Soci. Um, yeah. The first piece you wrote for us I was going to say after you were a student, but maybe you still were a student. But but the first piece we ever played were where those of us not named Josh Quillen touched a steel pan was in your piece, Melodic Concept 3, which we've been touring. And that's that's been wonderful. During the pandemic, you wrote us a piece called uh, Walk, March, Run that was a, a flexible commission for a bunch of different percussion studios. Yeah. Um, and all of that music feels like it just keeps keeps building and finding different outlets for your kind of language. And, and we learn a lot every time. Um, but I think at least from So's side, we had thought like two things, like one, like, man, sometimes it would just be really cool to commission like a mallet quartet from Kendall. Like what would Kendall do with a mallet quartet? Like the way you work with a, in a, in a, a steel band, what would that be like? Could that even work? What would it, you know, what would that whole process be like? And then I think after the other three of us, again, not named Josh Quillen, uh, went down to Trinidad for the first time. This is Josh's, you know, dozenth or 20th trip, something. But the three of us got to go down for a week and among other things, um, play on a rack uh, with Skiffle Bunch and learn your panorama that you and Mark and Odie were writing. Learn it um, basically with everyone else by rote. Uh, you know, I, I think before I went down there, you were nice and and sent a little bit of a PDF of some of the music um, just to start learning. But but pretty much I I love learning music in different ways. And I tried to just kind of go down and and uh, take it in note for note as you were teaching it. So first of all, thank you for that. That was an amazing experience. And I think we felt like, man, what would it be like to work more in that way with Kendall? Does this all feel like the right setting up of this story? Yeah, for sure. It's all checking out. Yeah. And uh, 
so this commission was, um, hey, can you write us a piece where um, you're teaching us all this music by rote and what would that do for your process and what would that do for the piece? So um, we're gonna play the first few minutes of it on Tuesday. Let's mm -hmm. think about it from your point of view. What has this, what's this process been like? Yeah, well, um, I think sort of like the first time I feel like you guys sort of threw out the idea that maybe, you know, a Mallet Quartet thing could be like a thing of the future. And I feel like that would like, it sort of happened. I, I can't say for how many years, but I feel like, like every so often we'd meet and that would just be kind of thrown out there. And I always kind of thought in the back of my head that I, I, I'd really like to try like doing something that entails the Mallet Quartet feeling like they're playing a panorama song just to hear how something like that would just sound really on completely different instruments. And I think a part of it maybe was sort of inspired by um, some of Michael Gordon's work um, and just sort of like hearing some of these same rhythms for like timber, you know, then sort of like used in different ways for rushes and stuff like that. And, and kind of feeling like, hmm, that's an interesting sort of concept. I love to kind of maybe do with steel pan and like the sort of panorama like rhythms and taking that and now putting that on maybe other instruments, you know, and sort of seeing and feeling like mm. what, like, so. Now, when you were at, when you were at NYU, were you studying, I know you studied with Julia. Yeah, actually I studied, I studied mostly with Michael. With I, Michael, I, that's what I was gonna, that's cool, man. I don't think I put that together. Yeah, yeah, actually he, we, yeah, we stuck together. We had, um, mm. we had my very first semester, actually it was Julie's recommendation. She was like, you know, I think you'd, you'd work really well with Michael. I think you guys. Oh, cool. But yeah, and then I got to him like that first semester and then every semester it had to be Michael. I was not trying to study with anybody else. That's cool, man. Okay, I just learned, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Okay, we're gonna fill in a couple of gaps. But my yeah. other question that I pinpoint, just to set the stage for anyone listening who knows less, even less than I do about uh, steel pan music. When you say like, oh, it would be really fun. Okay, I'm gonna write a Mallet Quartet and it'd be really fun to take a panorama song and make that work on... So for you, like, what's a panorama song? Like, I have, like, it's big. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of pans playing. I know it's about 10 minutes long or maybe exactly 10 minutes long. I know, mm -hmm. but, like, what, for you, what defines, like, a panorama song that you're going to put on a Mallet Quartet? Um, I think, for one, uh, the sort of the, the, a bit of the format and the makeup of it, um, you know, and, and, you know, the format being, like, how we, we speak about, like, intro, you know, an introduction, a verse, and a chorus. Um, must have, you know, either a variation or, a, or a, um, I forgot what a, what's the other word we use. We say solo variation or we say um, at something else or verse solo or something like that. And it's supposed to mean like two different things at times. Um, but just sort of like that idea of a structure. And then like we spoke about it at our last rehearsal, like we're like just about to the jam right now, you know, which is very pivotal in like a panorama, a panorama song, you know. Um, but I mean, also just kind of taking those terms and sort of, um, and sort of like connecting the dots for people as well, thinking of the jam as like this Montuno, you know, having this, you know, this sort of repeating bass, you know, thing that happens over time and, and you know, and, and the same chord, you know, the same chord progression that allows for a bunch of other things to sort of happen on top, like that kind of vibe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that is a great part of how I think about Panorama. It's mostly like about the format. Um, because really any song can sort of be thrown into that format. And so I think that that's one of the biggest things for me is structure wise. Um, and then also just, as you mentioned, kind of like the sound. So like thinking about lots of pans, but not in a sort of like a volume type of way, but more of in a, there's multiple layers that can be happening at, at one point in time, you know? And so for like arranging, for the most part, bare bones, we look at it as like six, particular lines, um, depending on the group that we that we work with, it could be more or depending on just the instruments that you have. Um, but I usually, so off, off, like, you know, when we're first starting, I always look at it as like six, yeah, six particular lines. And so part of- what, Wait, what are the six lines? Like, yeah. Yes, yeah, have the tenors on top, which is the tenors which you guys played at, um, when we when you guys came down to Skiffle in Trinidad. Um, then you have the double tenors, which is like sort of more of like a harmony focus. Um, to the, the, ten, the tenor is one pan, but is the double tenor two pans or is it just, it's two bit, double tenor is two pan, okay. But it has about the same length of the skirt as a tenor. 
Um, so yeah, but so the double tenor, so you have the tenor on top, the double tenor, then you have the double second, which is longer in skirt. That's what you guys play melodic concepts three on. Right. Uh, Josh, go to. Josh is a double second. Yeah, double right. Seconder. So uh, we usually use the double seconds to sort of double what the tenors are playing, um, just for sort of like power and strength and those types of things. So we have the tenor, we have double tenors harmony, uh, double seconds is sort of like an octave below. Um, then we have the guitars, which uh, have that strumming function. Um, so, you know, mostly it's like mostly the same rhythm, rhythmic pattern throughout the entire panorama song. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, it, you can really do what you want with that, but that's the general idea is they usually strum and they do this, you know, rhythmic sort of strumming pattern. Um, so that's all the off strumming is like all the bum, 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 but like yeah, all the, all the off beats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's really kind of not that far off from like the, like the strumming on like a rhythm guitar. Um, is that, you know, similar? Yeah the concept might not you know might not get all the rhythms at one point or might just play like a few or three you know you know all that kind of stuff that's like all you know that those are all like different strumming patterns and these are all used different times sometimes split up amongst instruments which is where the cello comes in so after guitar we have cello and cello could strum with the guitars and sometimes have like this sort of um uh this kind of like complementary strumming pattern um which kind of helps, you know, fill up a lot of things. And then, um, and then what is it? And then after that's bass. Yep. And that'll yeah, be yeah, yeah. down at the end of the last. And so with the four of us, we're, so the, our Malik Quartet and the way we think about Malik Quartet in general as a starting point is two vibes and two marimbas. Mm -hmm. So for us, is it right? Like my, my part is like double tenor, or sorry, is tenor vibe. Right. Eric's part is double tenor vibe. Yeah. Adam's part of strumming is like guitar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So he's like guitar, guitar, cello. So we kind of skip the double seconds maybe, and he's kind of guitar vibe. And then yeah. Josh's the bass. Is the bass, yep. And so those are like basically the six voices, you know, that I look at. I mean, with the exception, like you said, we skip the double second. And the double second is really just usually an octave below anyway. So, yeah. Right, right, right. Oh, that's cool. But so then what I know about Panorama that somebody listening to this may not know, um, because you just said, like, in terms of the arrangement, and I like, like, you, you, maybe it's possible, is it fair for me to say that sometimes you may use that word in different ways? Because, like, sometimes I hear that word being used around panorama, and to me, it just sounds like composer. You're saying, right. like, oh, the arranger of this panorama is this, but to me, it's kind of like, you're telling me all the notes to play, and they're pretty much your notes. So it feels in my language, right? Like composition. Um, yeah. So for a panorama, traditionally, like, when we were down there for panorama, mm -hmm. all the tunes are something that's maybe popular at that time on the radio or some kind of pop song that right. folks would know and then it's being arranged for the band for the panorama right and so you have the verse and chorus so you'll hear the melody from those tunes in the verse and chorus right and then and and then as you get into the variations and stuff you're using the maybe the chorus you're using something from that tune but it's getting further and further away from the tune right yeah is mm -hmm. that yeah, so that's exactly what that so that's exactly the the sort of um the the way that Panorama has gone, you know, just choosing the popular song. Um, but in in I want to say maybe not always as popular of a fashion, some people also compose their own tune that they then arrange for Panorama as well. Um, and so their idea is like to kind of you know make their song the popular song, you know, when they do it or one of the popular songs. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Meaning it's not a rule that you have to arrange a pop song. You can write your own song, your own. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no rule that says that you have to um, arrange a popular song. That was just more of like a, well, I'll play this because people already know it. And so mm. they easily associate. I think also just too, because before, I guess, small bit of history lesson, but yeah. with steel band, like steel bands were called steel bands before they actually had pitches and notes. Um, because they were taking things that they found on the floor that were, you know, made of tin and steel, and that was more durable. And so they started calling them steel bands before they even really had the notes. Um, and so when steel bands started to get to a point where it did have notes, people were so used to, to thinking that like steel bands were made of people beating on like garbage tins and things, you know, of that nature. And so they always associated it with noise. Um, and so if you speak to a lot of the older 
the the older um, folks that are really not into pan, steel pan as much, you know, because it was associated with violence and so many different things historically, you know, when it first started, um, that they also still associate steel pan instrument like with noise, you know what I mean? So they uh, hear, yeah. ah, that's too much noise, you know? <laughs> yeah, so because so, it really was so like at the beginning, steel pans, it wasn't so. At this point, when you're talking about it, there wasn't like a panorama or a big band or whatever. It was like steel bands were percussion ensembles. Yep, basically. That's exactly what it was. You know, I like, and then, I don't know, I find my trash, whatever, my my trash can. And you get yeah. like, I hear about cookie tins all the time. Like Josh will talk about right. cookie, like, you know, any kind of metal or or tin or whatever that you find around pot or pan or something and so is this i mean tell me where i'm gonna go wrong here i love this man this is just like i'm gonna make statements and you're gonna correct me and be more interesting <laughs> so at some point folks in this percussion ensemble we're playing multiple things and hit this cookie tin enough where like one like one one dent happened and they could count on that to sound that way every time they hit it it was like more of a pitch than a noise right and so then that's and then so then and then what <laughs> so then you have your note and you're like oh i can hammer in a few notes on this okay. yeah and just also realizing that like the more you hit it is probably the more you flattened it but then you sort of came up with you like you said new notes or extra you know bumps and dents and things like that that they realize oh hey what if we figured out a way to maybe separate these enough that they could, you know, all have a different sounding pitch and, but also I could hit each one and like they would stay that way for, you know, a, a fairly decent amount of time. Um, and so like in one of the earliest stages, they have this pan that they call the ping pong pan. And it was like this pan. And you, if you Google it, like you can find a pan. It's like, it, it's actually like a flat surface with like these weird looking bumps um, pushed up from underneath. And it's only four of them and they're like mm. widely spread out. And so that was the idea that like, you know, if you spread them out, then this one wouldn't bleed into that one. And so we could figure out a way to just for each one to sustain its pitch. And now we- Like that ping pong pan has four pitches. Yeah. So you could make a melody or a bass line or something with those four pitches. Right. Mm -hmm. And how long are we talking about? Like, how long does it go from, does it take to go from noise to four pitches to- chromatic multiple, um, multiple octave chromatic i mean it's like it's yeah it took some years yeah yeah it, it 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 literally took some years um because even before like the like what we have in terms of being fully chromatic like that was still a process they had something what they call um sing, well they call it single pan now but it's like pan around the neck or traditional pan which is like so the idea of like when they got into these instruments and stuff, they were really parading through the streets of, you know, like carnival or whatever. So you, you guys saw this, you know, so you were able to like experience, you know, parading through the street and seeing how the band of different bands move. And so the people were doing that. And so when they were picking up like instruments, they just continued walking through the streets playing stuff. And then when steel pan sort of started to evolve, then they were like, well, the bigger these things got, the harder it became to hold it and to play it. So they started putting it around their necks and call it pan around the neck um, because then they could walk and play and it would just be hoisted up on their necks and they could play the pans. But even when they were doing that, all not all the instruments were fully chromatic. Um, and so why they part of why they called it like single pan is because each person would only have one pan. So like if you were playing bass, you would only have one drum with two mm -hmm. notes, you know? Uh, right, and if you were playing- and, you, and you'd have like six other people or whatever would have the other notes? No, no, that, there was no. just it. You it just was, play the two, you. Yeah, right. so really the idea, and this is still like a competition today in Trinidad, because it's called, it's just, it's like tradition. When, so when we speak about traditional in, 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 the, in Trinidad in this tense of steel pan, we're speaking about single pan and pan around the neck and that mm -hmm. idea. So it is, still exists. So it's only, everyone is to one, one drum and one drum only. Um, so they didn't really have, so like what you were explaining for a drummer, to exist back in that time, it would be a drummer maybe with a snare, someone else maybe with a bass drum, and right. then this sort of how, but it was more rhythm section based. So it was less of like, you had a drummer and more of like, you had people, you know, sort of filling different roles within a traditional Trinidad rhythm section, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, which is really just another name for a percussion ensemble. Yeah, yeah, right. 
ton of like found instruments and a couple of, you know, maybe traditional, like I said, bass drum or snare or something like that, you know? Um, so yeah. So, so playing around the neck is playing around the neck. Like, so it, it could be like one, like a, a scale, like it could be in, in a certain key. Right. So but actually, not necessarily chromatic. Right. So the, the tenor after a while, they, they worked up the tenor to a point where it was fully chromatic. But for some time, and like even now, the rest of the ensemble, I believe they can only play in like two keys or so. Um, I, I forget. I, I haven't. I don't. I'm not as familiar with the notation. Um, it's like in band. traditional in s single pan or. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, so. But yeah, the the keys are like limited. You know. Um, so let's say if it's G, you. I think you could play like G, D, and A or something like right. that. Some right, yeah. Right, right. Limited because again, everyone you know has one pen, and so they had a single tenor, a single seconds, a single, um, a single guitar, um, and a single bass. Um, well, they they had another name for that, but the single seconds it was called a single seconds or a second, as in second pan. You had your first pan was the tenor. That's what they call that because it would be responsible for the melody, and the second pan, which is now double seconds or single seconds, um, was the second pan, and that was like longer skirt. It could do some harmony stuff or, you know, sort of reinforce parts of the melody, but it still didn't have all the notes that a tenor would, you know? Um, wow. Yeah, so that's part of the evolution. That's part of the history. <laughs> Man, I love this. I, I I did exactly what I didn't didn't think I was going to do, but it's great. I'm like, <laughs> like you know, this, we can talk for 10 minutes. We're just going to talk about Tuesday. This is so much panorama information, man. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so my question, the reason I wanted to know more about Panorama or set the stage with Panor more about Panorama is that, like, so I know what my experience was learning, you know, different pieces that you've written for us. A lot of concept three, let's say, you know, I, I got my patterns, I learned my part. You, you know, you're a, a very, I think you're a very collaborative composer in terms of like you come in and like, you know, we go back and forth, but like, you know, you were sending parts and I would learn the parts, like, oftentimes classical music is done then I had never had the experience of the other it's not it's not 100 percent different but it's a, a different mode of transmission of the ideas mm -hmm. of okay we're going to stand up in front of the band and either like I had the experience either um okay a lot of people here already know a lot of these sections I got to go out in the yard and like learn some stuff before I come back to my rack or whatever you know mm -hmm. so somebody will teach me that but then like I got to be there when like just the band's learning new sections mm -hmm. and you're just calling out, okay, tenors, your first note's E, then it's F sharp, G, E, F sharp, G, A. Like, okay. And the rhythm is bum, ba, bum, 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 ba, 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 bum. Oh, okay. And then the next note is C sharp. Let's hear that. You know, and it, like really teaching it that way, I had just never had that experience in, in pan, right? Yeah. Um, I had had that experience in other worlds. I never had it here, which is so... Um, because I think sometimes having that experience in another world where things are very repetitive, mm -hmm. like, I, I guess I, I, I don't know, that, that makes sense to be like, you know, learn this thing and then do it this many times while the, you know what I mean? But like, yeah. I mean, the melodies I was learning for the, your tune with Mark and Odie, I mean, it wasn't much repetition. It was like every, every bar was different. <laughs> so learning in this really kind of crazy note by note way, to me, it feels like that has to lead to making music and writing music in a different way. And it has for us learning your piece like this. What about for you as a composer, though? Like, how is either working with Panorama or working with So on this new piece where you'll come in, you'll be like, okay, today we're going to learn, like, you know, we'll call it the intro, but it may be the outro tomorrow. <laughs> we'll, we'll learn these eight bars, you know, and then teaching it to us part by part. How has that changed? what you think the sound of the music is going to be in the end in terms of wait sorry are you you speaking in terms of like the the idea of how i arrange for like panorama stuff or and how that potentially com affects my composing and then sort of like the relay yeah or like how yeah how is it different to arrange panorama style whether you're doing it for a panorama or for so how is that different than sitting down and composing pen to paper where you know you're going to give somebody a part Right. Yeah. I mean, um, it's confusing every day um, because honestly, I jump back and forth between the two. And so like um, even, you know, as we've 
gone through our part process, like our last rehearsal, I kind of changed some things up a bit, you know, drastically from what we've been kind of doing before. Yeah. So like, <laughs> right. <laughs> and part of that comes from, you know, the amount of time that I sort of spent like thinking about the piece. Cause initially I came in with this like entire sort of panorama kind of idea. It's sort of like etched in my brain. Like, so I'm going to write this piece and it's, you know, going to start with this sort of idea of what a verse and chorus would be like, and like a popular tune, and then sort of develop that over time, because that's the style of panorama writing, um, which I sort of like kind of quickly realized um, may not always be a style in just composing on the whole, you know what I mean? Like it, it may not necessarily be an A-B section. It might just be just a theme, you know what I mean? That this or this, you know, little motif that you know, just to really get small, like this little motif that then just sort of like grows over time, you know? And so it's like, it's maybe not verse and chorus, it's just thing <laughs> 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 or something. So like, I go back and forth between the two quite a bit and sort of like trying to figure that out. And um, honestly, um, um, Michael Gordon actually <laughs> helped me to say that I got to bring his name back up because he uh, kind of yeah. helped me to see that um, in a way in one of our lessons, I never forget, like I did this composition and he comes in and he's just like, well, why do you have all this stuff going on all the time? And so I was just kind of like, well, you know, I, I, so I started to speak to him about like the whole panorama thing. And so the way I was viewing the, my approach to composition, or actually, no, sorry, this was a panorama song I was showing him. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. I was showing him my panorama arrangements first. And so I was kind of giving him an idea of like why I think about composition in this way. And he was like, well, what if they just weren't doing that for a period of time, then what? And then I was just like, oh my. Like, that well, just- I mean, like he took out the melody or he took out like, what if the tenors weren't playing now for a while? Right. Or, what? or well, to be more specific, he actually took out some of the strumming stuff and was just like, mm -hmm. what if that wasn't happening like for a while because you know, they're just doing the same thing over and over. And I was just like, hmm, that changed quite a bit. You know, then I started to think, well, what if this just doesn't exist anymore? You mm -hmm. know, but, and then I took that into like writing, you know, just composing on the whole, you know, so I took this sort of arranging brain and now put it on composing, trying to figure out, you know, how I'm going to maybe have things exist that may or may not repeat, you know, um, over time, which is a bit of what we're kind of dealing with as well, because we don't really have any like hard repetitions right now, yeah. but we have the idea of like the A and the B, you know, this verse and chorus A, B that sort of now develops over time, very similar to a panorama song would. Right, right. Man, it's funny. I realized like, I wonder if Adam being the one playing the chords, I wonder if he'll have a better sense of when we're in the A and the B. Cause like, as we go into different variations, like right now at least i hear them each as their own thing and i'm not thinking like oh this is a chorus variation or it's like and it's cool yeah it's 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 pretty cool to hear how things relate to you mm -hmm. yeah I think for us like we're still like we have different brain on with it yeah. you know? but um, i mean i i because in our last rehearsal as well i was sort of i think i i, I might have said some mention that to you like i, I kind of laughed a bit because i was like you know just listening and seeing you guys interact and like, you know, Adam mentioning that this is how, like, he understands it. And I was just like, well, I didn't, I do not understand it at all that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or I'm not it at all that way. And so it's always shocking when I hear like, yeah, I'm actually kind of counting this, this particular way. Right, right, right. No, you were yeah. laughing at me when you were teaching us some opening rhythms. And I was singing it based on where I thought the one was or whatever that is, you know, and you're like, I have no idea where you're feeling this. <laughs> put everything a whole like note you know over or something like that yeah 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 I do remember that I do remember yeah. that so, yeah I, I, I love that I mean I have to say I I I have a, a pretty um so my my Trinidad <laughs> was going to Bali for less time than Josh has gone to Trinidad so I, I don't want to paint it as the same thing but it was like two months in Bali like learning music where it was like I just graduated from the Eastman School of Music, like conservatory, dude. I feel good about myself. And I'm just like trying to learn these melodies. And like <laughs> my teacher there or like his brother or something would just start playing a melody for me. And I'd like get the first two notes. And then I wouldn't. And I'm I'm ready for him to stop and be like, oh, cool. cool. Those were the first two. Here's the third. And it was like, 
バゲンコケンココンコンコンコケンコケンコンコケンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコンコン It felt like I was learning it in a deeper way where I was going to remember it for a long time or it was going to come back to me really quickly.、Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and like、um, learning things in that other way or in a, in a, in a real way. Sometimes it feels like、um, such a slow process,、mm-hmm. um, but then it's amazing to feel like it can be a really deep process, you know?、Um, mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I wonder, I know from our side, I'll say learning, learning this way in terms of. Learning this piece versus learning like melodic concept or something. I think, like, you know, we've never had music in front of us. So we're memorizing it from the beginning. Right. And right. so it feels like、um, <laughs> until the last rehearsal, you just said to everybody, hey, why don't you just like play these rhythms with your feet while you're playing everything we learned over the last three months? <laughs> Being like, oh man, I'm just trying to keep this bass drum going. And like, All of a sudden, now downbeats are different to me than they were because I was hearing, you know what I mean? You're like, yeah. Until you did that, it was like, oh, this pretty much feels like we could put this on stage. Cause like every time we learn it, like we're learning it, we, we know it pretty well from the beginning. Cause like you can either know it or not. You know, that like it feels like there's less, like you can't fake your way through things and stuff. Yeah.、So、it、Absolutely. feels like there's this deepness to the learning. And then, Kendall, man, when we, when we ran the music right before you left the other day, and we were like, oh my God, this is amazing. How long was that, Eric? And he's like, it was three minutes. And I, I think we all were like, holy shit. Oh, man. Because we've been hanging pretty regularly over the last four months, like kind of getting together once a week or, you know, a couple, you know, several hours a month. And, and, And putting together what we're super pumped about. They're like,、mm-hmm. oh my God, yeah, that's right. Like, there's this, this is amazing. And like, we, let's find some dates, Kendall. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a really intense and awesome way to learn.、Um, but it takes yeah. us, yeah. Yeah. It's also kind of funny you said that thing about like, you know, after all this like sort of hard work and stuff, it's like all of a sudden, Only, you know, after all of that, it's only three minutes. And that's actually something that we go through like during the panorama season as well. And when we're like teaching, it's like, it feels like you've got, but you've only really gotten like two to three minutes. And, and you reach like the jam or sort of like maybe towards the end of the jam. And the jam tends to be like the midway point.、Mm. And once you like, once you get over that, like you get to the jam, it's like, oh, shoot, the song is done. You know what I mean? Like the song is basically done. Because you, you have this sort of like sense of like,、oh, all right, I've reached this you know, particular plateau of like the halfway mark. So, yeah, it's just kind of interesting. Just I say that to also say that I think once we finish the jam, the song, it's going to be quick. It's going to go quicker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, and also, it's like, I think when we first learned stuff, like the verses and the choruses were repeating for a while. Right, yeah. Like、mm-hmm. there was a repetition when we first learned it. Yeah. And then there's this other music that I think we all love. That you've thrown out so far, or that's not in the form right now. Yeah.、Um, and I'll say for me as a composer, man, I'm pretty I'm impressed and I respect immensely.、Uh, you'll just kind of throw, you're okay throwing things out too. Yeah, sort of.、Um, sort of. Sort of.、Um, yeah. I, I learned that、um, it was an experience. It's hard for me, I think. Yeah. Right. The thing is, I, The thing is, when you say it as a composer, I, I cringe inside.、Mm. Because as a composer, it is very hard for me to throw out music. Like, I almost never want to do it.、Mm. But as an arranger, I always want to throw out music.、Mm. Just that simple switch of word from calling me a composer to calling me an arranger. If I was an arranger, I'd throw out music every, probably every rehearsal. I'd be like, all right, scrap that. I have an entirely different idea.、Yeah. And if、um, I was working with like a group, and because they have, they memorize parts, you know,、mm-hmm. um, and I remember that I couldn't figure out what direction I wanted to go in. And I think I came with like seven options, and they had to memorize all of them. And then I had to like say, okay, I don't like that one. All right, we're ruling that one out. And like, 
dwindling down to this one thing like okay this is the one and so like i would say yeah this is you know option four you know well, let's go with that we're going with option four and then everyone has to be like what what's option four again yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, you know again just need us to say like as an arranger for sure i'll throw out music mm -hmm. all day every day if i have to as a composer it it feels a lot different yeah yeah uh, yeah to bear with that man it's interesting i mean it's like um it's interesting being on on the side of the learning thing because I'm, I'm sure also some of it you haven't maybe thrown out some of it is like there's a super cool groove that we've learned i think that could be part of the jam at some moment but isn't in the version we're playing on tuesday night mm -hmm. um, there's this whatever that's i don't know if it's a I was going to say the C section, <laughs> like, but I don't know, like this, this music we've learned that, that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Like maybe I think you, you may have it in your head sometime that that's going to come back another moment or it could be gone, but like being, it's, it's interesting to see the process from, from this side and like understand mm -hmm. a lot of the process, but then also know that like you have a different sense of where this is going than we do. Um, yeah. Yeah. It is that you mentioned it because I think, um, part of my time at NYU, um, learning composition and then like transitioning to my time, the beginning of my time at Princeton and now basically at the end, it's sort of like I can see for myself like this sort of circle that I literally made from starting with, I used to, I would compose something, but every, you know, measure or every section would be something different and may not even be relating as much to the last section just because I was in this arranging mind frame in the come sort of like composer's realm. So I was just sort of like standing outside or, you know, just standing on both sides or whatever. And then, um, you know, met up with Michael and he was just like, oh, let's strip this down. Let's, let's start with one idea and let's just make sure that this idea can be kept as interesting as possible for a specific amount of time. And then mm -hmm. that sort of turned into, okay, now let's get to Princeton and apply like all of these, you know, things in, you know, some more proper ways and with some, you know, better resources or well, not better resources, but some, but more options mm -hmm. in terms of resources really it. Um, and then now coming back to like me working on, or just in general, finding more of a balance between the two and like, sort of using the best of like of both and so um yeah our, our our song our original song right now has an a and a b section and in some ways we've already started to develop both sections mm -hmm. um so that's kind of like where we sort of like end up we're kind of like towards the end of like that second development of like the second b section um and yeah i think it it's it's all interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I love hearing I love hearing stories about Michael, man, and what uh, that's a different lens for me to see this through, which is really cool. I, I have so much respect for him. As yeah, a yeah, so you know, yeah, so pumped yeah. about that music, man. I think early on, just to maybe maybe wrap up, I know a thought I had at the end of this last rehearsal was that I think one of our first rehearsals we were learning stuff, and then there were questions about like. Yeah, is it just gonna be a mallet quartet or are there gonna be other instruments? And I remember somebody brought up this band Buke and Gaze. And we're like, oh man, there's this this band that we worked with some we really love. It's like basically, it may have been Josh talking about it. It's like they play like the rhythm section in their feet and they're playing like guitar and bass and stuff in their in, you know, with their hands and then singing. It's kind of like this awesome thing where it's like just two people, but they're making so much sound. And yeah. we've been through a lot of things here and a lot of percussion instruments have have showed up in different ways. Mm -hmm. And then this last version where we're playing basically the engine room rhythm section vibe in our feet while we're doing everything in our hands. I don't know how it's going to sound on Tuesday, but I think it's a badass idea and a perfect way for so it's a perfect in for so into this idea of like, what is it like to arrange a panorama for right. a Malik quartet? Because what, you know. I'm not going to play those melodies in the same way as as you would on a pan. I would probably rather hear you play the melodies on the pan. I'm not going to play the the bass drum in the same way as Jerry on would play the bass drum, but I can do them together. <laughs> and that's like a cool, you know what I mean? It's like, it feels like a um, something that we can offer this vibe, you know, right. and maybe a lot of these other folks that I, I um, respect so highly. It's not what you do. You know what I mean? Which like, seems like it's leading in a way of like, oh, this feels like a so percussion vibe in a great way. Right. I want to give that compliment to you. 
thank you, thank you. And I want to ask for forgiveness uh, <laughs> on Tuesday night. You know, we've said this to other folks who played on Brooklyn Bound. We still see Brooklyn Bound for ourselves as a space to try things out. And so this is a perfect kind of like midway point for us to try this this jam out, yeah. uh, try this piece out, because um, we're gonna do the whole thing in April, I think. Um, yeah. You know, we'll see, see, yeah. What's that? This piece that doesn't have a name yet. It's true. This piece that doesn't that shall be named. Yeah. Um, but we're yeah, this moment on Tuesday is gonna be is gonna be a great moment in the development. Um, but it's gonna be wild and woolly in the best way. Um yeah. and, and then I think I appreciate you. I think you're gonna play a little pan on, on the night as well. Yep. Either yeah, definitely. Solo or maybe play with, with Josh a little bit. Um yeah. I always look forward to that. I, I feel like, you know. I love you both as pan players and you, I feel like you're very different approach to sound making in a very cool way. <laughs> um, yeah. Take it easy on him, Kendall. Take it yeah. easy on him. <laughs> <laughs> All so, right, man. You have any last thoughts before we, 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 we go our separate ways. Uh, just, I mean, hoping everyone um, enjoy, you know, enjoys the piece and also just coming out to, you know, Brooklyn Bound in general. And I think supporting, I think it's like you mentioned, just a great way to just sort of try out new things and, you know, kind of see what happens. And, and, and yeah, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited to hear it and excited for us to continue to develop it because I think it's really happening in a unique way. And I've also think for myself, um, we, I reached a turning point as well. Um, where I was like, I was approaching the song in just one way for a while. And I'm now reaching a point where I'm, I'm now looking at this in a way that I actually feel way more comfortable, but also think I can now be even more effective than I probably would have been before in the way that I was looking at it. So I'm excited, you know, I'm even more excited now. <laughs> Love it, man. I love when you're edge of your chairs. I see the excitement, Kendall. You just <laughs> sat, you sat forward. I love it. Yeah. Um, man, the night's going to be really fun. I don't know. You know, Andrea Monteriello. Yeah. Andrea's yeah. going to be singing and playing a little bit. I'm going to play with him too, which would be great. Right. Um, and it's awesome quartet momentum. Uh, first time we've ever had them out to Brooklyn Bound. So uh, right. we're pumped about it. So I'll uh, see you in the studio yeah. next Tuesday, friend. Absolutely. All right. Everybody else, come on out if you can. We're at the Soap Percussion Studio, um, eight o'clock show uh and i believe you can you can watch it on facebook live if you're not gonna gonna be able to come out um all right kendall you're the best all man right. thanks for hanging i'll Thank see you soon see ya. take care